Photosynthesis has two phases, the light-dependent and light-independent reactions. The light-dependent reactions convert light energy into chemical energy, taking in photons and water and producing oxygen, as well as high energy NADPH and ATP. These reactions take place in the thylakoid membrane and involve photoexcitation. In other words, a photon brings an electron to a higher energy state. The energy from this excited electron is harnessed via an electron transport chain, and the electron goes back to a lower energy state as it does a bunch of work for the plant. Meanwhile, the light independent reactions, often referred to as the Calvin cycle, involve the input of the high energy molecules produced in the first phase, as well as carbon dioxide and RUBP to produce carbon-based molecules the plant can use, such as glucose. These reactions take place in the chloroplast stroma. Light-dependent reactions need light and take place during the day. Light-independent or dark reactions don't need light, so they could take place any time. Leaves are green because inside each plant cell there are many chloroplasts, each full of the green pigment chlorophyll. The parts of the chloroplast you need to remember to understand photosynthesis are the stroma and the granum, which is a stack of thylakoid discs. If you were to take a granum and look at a cross section, you would find the site of the light dependent reactions at the thylakoid membrane. The electron transport chain conducting these reactions is found here on the thylakoid membrane. Note the location of the stroma as well as the lumen, in other words, the inside of the thylakoid disc. The complexes involved in these reactions are listed here. A mnemonic you can use to remember these complexes is shown below. The mnemonic summarizes the processes occurring during the light reactions, and you can match the colors of the words to the colors of the complex names shown at the top. Here are the complexes. Photosystem 2, Oxygen Evolving Complex, Cytochrome B6F, Photosystem 1, Ferrodoxin NADP reductase, and finally, ATP synthase. The mobile electron carriers, listed here, shuttle electrons from one complex to the next. The mobile electron carriers include plastoquinone QB, plastocyanin, and ferrodoxin. The first step in the electron transport chain is photoexcitation. We need a photon to excite an electron. The energy from the photon makes it go from a high to a low energy state, allowing it to power reactions. Photoexcitation occurs at two complexes. You guessed it. Photosystems 2 and 1. Each of these photosystems is full of chlorophyll molecules. When a photon hits one of the chlorophyll molecules in photosystem 2, resonance energy causes the energy from that photon to hop from one chlorophyll molecule to the next, within the complex until it reaches the chlorophyll in the reaction center. Here, an electron is excited. In its high energy state, it has potential to do work for the cell. This process occurs twice, producing two excited electrons. Meanwhile, the oxygen evolving complex, which is converted to an unstable state by the incoming electron, is busy splitting water molecules. This serves two purposes. Firstly, the electrons used by photosystem 2 are replenished by the splitting of one water molecule. As a byproduct, once two water molecules have been split, the oxygen atoms combine into O2. The plant considers this a waste product. The second purpose of the water splitting involves the hydrogens released into the lumen. These protons serve to increase the proton gradient, so that there is a higher concentration of protons in the lumen than in the stroma. The greater the gradient, the more badly the protons will want to diffuse to the other side. Next, plastoquinone QB picks up the two excited electrons from the reaction center chlorophylls in photosystem 2, along with two protons from the stroma, and shuttles them to cytochrome B6F. Here, the plastoquinone QB passes the electrons to the complex and releases the two protons into the lumen. Cytochrome B6F then adds a further two protons into the lumen, further building up the gradient. Plastocyanin now picks up the two electrons and transfers them to photosystem 1. The electrons receive an additional energy boost with the help of two additional photons and get transferred onto the last mobile carrier, 
ferredoxin. Ferredoxin then transports the electrons to ferredoxin NADP reductase, which uses the two electrons plus a proton from the stroma to convert NADP plus to the higher energy molecule NADPH. Note that this also contributes to the proton gradient by removing a proton from the stroma. So now we come to ATP synthase. Here is where the plant uses the proton gradient it's been building. The protons now desperately want to diffuse from the lumen into the stroma, and ATP synthase uses them to power the production of the high energy molecule ATP. For every three protons that pass through ATP synthase, one molecule of ADP is combined with inorganic phosphate to create ATP. Now we come to the light independent reactions. In other words, the Kelvin cycle. Remember, the purpose of this cycle is to use the high energy molecules created in the light dependent reactions to produce useful carbon based molecules, such as glucose, out of RUBP and CO2 the plant absorbs from the surrounding air via its stomata. The first step of this cycle, in which CO2 is attached to RUBP, is catalyzed by the enzyme Rubisco. This process is termed carbon fixation since carbon is being converted from a gaseous form as CO2 into a solid. Now, the addition of carbon dioxide to RUBP creates an unstable 6-carbon intermediate, and this intermediate quickly breaks down into two 3-carbon chains. These two 3-carbon chains are called PGAs. Next, a coupling of reactions occurs. This is how cells use ATP and other high-energy molecules to do work. After charging these molecules up, they couple the catabolic, exothermic backward reactions to endothermic reactions. In this case, the energy released from the breakdown of two ATP molecules is used to convert two unstable NADPH molecules back into NADP+, with the protons from the NADPHs being added to the PGAs to form two G3Ps, which are the ultimate product of the Calvin cycle. One of these G3Ps can leave the cycle and can be used to build glucose, a 6-carbon molecule, and other carbohydrates to add to the plant's biomass. The other G3P now uses ATP to get converted back to RUBP so the cycle can repeat. But hang on, something doesn't quite add up. We produce two G3Ps, each of which has three carbons. How are we producing glucose, which has six carbons, and RUBP, which has five carbons? In reality, we have to consider six rounds of the Calvin cycle all happening at the same time. We actually need six CO2 molecules to enter the Calvin cycle to produce one molecule of glucose, one for each carbon. With six cycles happening at once, we have 12 G3Ps produced, for a total of 36 carbons. Two of those G3Ps can now be used in the production of glucose, and the remaining 30 carbons can be used for the production of six more RUBPs. One more thing to note, Rubisco actually kinda sucks, and sometimes confuses oxygen for CO2. This is why plants must keep oxygen levels low in their leaves.